I'm Renee Williams. And I'm Billy Thomas. And welcome to another edition of From the Woods Today. You know, Billy, there's a lot of different things that, you know, woodland owners have to know, um, like who do who they contact for their forest, who do they contact for wildlife, who do they, you know, and we're going to try to help them with that. Oh, yeah. I'm so excited about today's show. Thank you all for being with us today. Um, we've got a great new guest on, but a really important guest who uh, is going to be kind of a, hopefully a gateway to a lot of support for a lot of our landowners out there in the state. Um, yeah, you mentioned it, Renee. People are looking for help. They want to do good stuff with their property, but who can help them and what can they do when they do find those people? So today we've got uh, Mr. Jacob Stewart and we'll have him on in just a moment. But, but um, Jacob is with the Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife for Resources and he oversees the, the biologists that are available to work with landowners in the state of Kentucky. So believe it or not, a wildlife biologist can come out, meet with you on your property, and help you kind of manage habitat for wildlife and so much more. Um, so we'll be hearing from Jacob. We've also got our ever popular Tree of the Week series um, back with a new one. Um, and we'll save that one until we get um, until we roll that footage. But I'm um, glad to have you all with us today. Thanks for being here. If you've got any questions, you want to interact with our guests, use the chat function, and um, we'll, we'll get back to you quickly on that. So uh, let's go ahead and get started. Jacob, if you want to go ahead and turn on your camera. Welcome to the show again. We appreciate you being on. Hey, no problem, Renee. Thank you for having me. Oh, yeah. Very excited to have you, Jacob. You know, we partner a lot here at UK Forestry um, with Fish and Wildlife. And, um, you know, we consider you all a very valuable, important partner. But you also are a great service to our landowners across the state. So we're so glad to have you here talking about some of that stuff. Oh, thank you so much uh, uh, for having me. And like you said, uh, the partnerships are what make this stuff drive. So, um, uh, so. Yeah, so y'all want me to go ahead and jump right into it? Yeah, that'd be great, yeah. All right. So as uh, Billy Renee and Renee uh, introduced me here, I'm talking about uh, Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife's private lands program. Um, so kind of the overview of what I'm covering today, uh, I'm going to talk about why we have a private lands program. Why is it important to the state of Kentucky that we have biologists across the state to help you manage your property? We'll cover that first. And then I'm going to look at what the private land programs uh, provide to you. So as the biologist comes and talks to you, what is, what is he going to provide you? What kind of information? Uh, what's it going to entail? Um, so just kind of the overall of, of what the program provides the landowner. And then briefly discuss possible financial assistance uh, and how to reach your biologist. Uh, just, so just a quick overview of that stuff. So. Um, Kentucky is about 25 million acres. Um, this map right here shows a bunch of dots of where our WMAs and public hunting ground is across the state of Kentucky. Um, that between federal, state owned and uh, county owned uh, lands that for just hunting purposes, this doesn't include parks and uh, natural areas, uh, but just for hunting purposes, uh, there's 1.6 million acres that we have uh, lined out for the public to have access to in the state of Kentucky. Um, and 25% of hunters use public land. Uh, and only 2% of hunters use, use only public land, ex exclusively public land. So that's just an overview of the public land and what we have available in Kentucky. This is different than kind of out west. Um, as you go out that way where the majority of the state is owned in uh, some kind of public ownership. So just a quick uh, overview of, of, of why we have uh, an importance of uh, private lands program. Um, and as you'll see here on the right of your screen, uh, your land is Kentucky and you are fish and wildlife. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, publicly owned, we only have 6%. Privately owned is about 94% of the state is privately owned. Um, so around 98% of our hunters use private land and around 75% of our hunters only use private land uh, exclusively. Um, that's just talking about hunters, but you know, if 94% of our ground is, uh, is privately owned, obviously 94% uh, of, the, of the state is managed by private land owners. So this is why it's important uh, for species across the state of Kentucky, uh, hunted, non-game, um, 
just any type of species that needs management, uh, private ownership is really important on keeping that species on the landscape. So that's the importance of the private lands program. Uh, and what uh, we try to push to landowners is, is the idea of, you know, kind of like what it says here on your screen, you are Kentucky and you are fish and wildlife. So we're here to provide you the information uh, to manage the species that you're uh, interested in to make sure it thrives uh, not only on your property, but on the landscape of Kentucky for everybody throughout the Commonwealth. Kentucky Private Lands Biologist, um, what we provide. So um, as you call a biologist and they come out to your place, uh, what we provide is technical guidance. Uh, this technical guidance is based on your objectives. Uh, we don't have any preconceived notion when we come to your farm on, on what we're trying to manage your place for. This is based solely on what your objective is. If it's managing turkey, we'll give you information on turkey. Salamanders, we'll give you that information. Uh, butterflies, any type of uh, anything that is your goal is to see more wildlife on your property. That's what we're here to push and to help you get there. So if we come to your place, uh, you know, one of the main things we're going to discuss with you is what your objectives are. And then we're going to lay out a plan on how you reach those objectives. Um, there's no obligation to open your land to the public. Uh, once you meet with us and we give you a plan and we're working with you, it's still your private property. You own it uh, and you manage it. So uh, there's no obligation to open your land to the public. Free. It's free of charge. Uh, we charge nothing. Uh, it's a service that hunt and fishing license uh, help pay for. Uh, through the Pitt and Robertson Act uh, and some uh, and partnerships through NRCS, uh, they allow that service to be free of charge to you. Um, and again, our goal is to meet your objectives uh, for what you want to manage with on your property. So after we meet with you, uh, we'll provide you a plan map. I'll show you some of those here in just a minute of what they entail. So pretty, pretty much give you a plan of, uh, of what you need to do on your property to get where you need to get to. Reference materials. So uh, if we say you need to plant uh, to meet your objectives, you should plant a wildflower field. We'll lay out what wildflowers are best suited for your area uh, and for the species you're looking to manage for. Um, and so therefore you can follow that information and get it, uh, get it installed correctly and, uh, and be most beneficial to your species. Um, so we also give you information and guidance on funding opportunities. So there is funding opportunities that I'll cover more in depth uh, as I go later in this uh, presentation, but uh, we also provide that information for you as well. All right, so what is conservation technical guidance? So basically I'm gonna go over a few different things, kind of showing you examples of um, how I made a plan uh, for a landowner to, to show them what opportunities they had for their property and uh, for the specific landowner. Uh, they were looking at uh, quail management. Um, so this here is a typical landowner map. You have, um, you know, I have the outlines of the property in yellow. Uh, the red is existing uh, fence that they are running cattle, uh, cattle operation on right now. Um, the fields, the 37 acres and 30 acres, uh, there are actually crop at this point, and the 16.5 is hay. So their main objective was to look at trying to increase quail on their property. Um, so basically, I'm going to go through uh, a couple different options um, to, to show kind of a plan we came up with to help them reach their goal. Uh, their goal was also to not put it specifically in wildlife habitat, but to keep some um, cattle operation and row crop operation going at the same time. Uh, but doing it in such a way that'll benefit quail. So uh, the first option I gave them was um, solely on making it uh, a cattle operation. If you look on the 16.5, we fenced it out, uh, fenced that field out, we fenced the, uh, the next field out, and then also made uh, 19 acres worth of native warm season grass, uh, either paddock for forage or hay, and then the 30.4 acres in the back, we went and fenced it out. All the um, wooded draws there uh, would be fenced out to allow, uh, to keep some, some habitat for quail along the edges of the, uh, 
the grazing and then your native warm season grass uh, area will increase your usable space during the nesting season uh, before you start rotating cattle in them or cut the hay. Um, yeah, so, and then up at the top, you'll see there's a pond. Uh, we threw a um, two acre pollinator planting up there for color and for brooding cover for quail for the landowner. So this right here, this option right here is uh, the idea of taking the operation to a cattle only type operation and doing some rotational grazing. The next option was to keep the cattle on the front, but, and then the row crops in the back, but go ahead and add some uh, native warm season grass buffers. Uh, so basically come out into the field into your least productive uh, shaded out areas of your crop field and put some buffers in to take uh, advantage of the CRP program, which pays soil, soil rental payments. Um, so you're not out all your money on those. And a lot of times, uh, if you look at your production, you can break even uh, on that sometimes. So this, met, this, this option here was to increase, uh, to increase the quail usable space um, along with row crops and just keep the grazing system in place. And then last, it was uh, kind of a mixture of all of it. Uh, row crops, uh, haying and grazing, uh, just uh, kind of using all the tools in the toolbox to, to eat, put as much habitat on the ground as you can while you're still benefiting quail. Um, so diversity is the key uh, for wildlife and wildlife management. Uh, so this is the kind of information we help provide and a little guidance on where you need to go. Uh, the thing to keep in mind is, is uh, when we come out and talk to you, um, don't uh, don't go into it too fast. Uh, it's a lot of work uh, to manage and to manage correctly. So the plan is set up to meet your needs, not only as the wildlife aspect, but your time needs as far as how you're going to get it done and when you get it done. Uh, the last map I got to show you here is kind of just a wildlife. So. Uh, there are some recreational landowners who solely have a piece of property uh, for recreational for hunting. Um, and this is kind of a plan made up for that. Uh, if you'll notice, we got some edge feathering to diversify the transition from open fields to forest. Um, and we also have some annual food plots that will fallow, uh, some tree plantings, some uh, timber management, some patch cuts. Uh, Woodland creation on this on this uh, property would would entail um, actually cutting out some cedar uh, to benefit the oak stands that were there. Uh, so just all kinds of different stuff and diversify the property and the habitat and make you know that any key to management is to make the piece of property uh, provide the habitat for 365 days a year. So the most important thing is to understand what your species needs are for all 365 days and make sure you provide that habitat for them uh, across your property. Uh, you'll maintain, uh, you'll maintain, you'll keep the, the populations on your property longer if you're able to provide that diversity. So now I'm just gonna kind of, kind of talk about the landscape of Kentucky. And again, this kind of drives home the importance of private land management, um, and not just on your property, but on your neighbor's property and your neighbor's property. Um, Based on uh, USD agriculture statistics, an average farm in Kentucky is somewhere between 150, 175 acres. Uh, that's gonna vary uh, where you go across the state, but on average, that's, that's the size of a farm. So as you go to start managing your farm, um, and if you have that, uh, that average size farm of 150 acres, if you look down through this um, list of a home range uh, for different species and popular species across the state, uh, White-tailed deer's typical home range is around 640 acres, which is about a square mile. A wild turkey's home range is 400 acres. Uh, Bob White, a covey of uh, a covey of Bob White uh, in the winter, home range is about 150 acres. So the whole point of this is to drive home the point, the, the idea of the importance. Um, most landowners don't have uh, own a white-tailed deer's home range or a wild turkey's home range. You may have the home range of one covey of Bob White on your property uh, if, uh, if the habitat is done correctly. So those acreages for the home ranges can go up or down uh, based on the quality of habitat. Um, if a deer has 
good quality habitat on 150 acres, they'll spend more time in that and less time on the fringes of that uh, during the year. Um, so the, that's the importance of trying to include a diverse of habitats uh, for, for the species throughout the year and to meet their needs. Uh, and the more you can provide uh, for the species you're looking for, the better chance you have to hold those deer longer so you have an opportunity to see them, hunt them, um, or just protect them uh, on your place. So the idea is, is not just for you to do uh, habitat management, but to work with your neighbor. Uh, it's a good time to go, you know, see what they're interested in, see where you all can work together. Your property may have opportunities um, that theirs doesn't and vice versa. And keep in mind the importance of each one of those throughout the year to maximize the populations on the landscape. So I'm gonna just kind of quickly go through the breakdown of the landscape of Kentucky and kind of talk about the habitat management um, practices that we suggest uh, throughout some of these uh, landscapes or land uses. So the biggest land use or land type cover in Kentucky is uh, forest land at 13 million acres. Um, and good, that's just a round number. Uh, it's not exactly 13 million, but um, as you can see, uh, if you're a landowner in Kentucky, more than likely you probably have a woodlot or something nearby that, uh, that could use a little management. Um, so these pictures right here kind of show uh, what stuff we kind of suggest and some limiting factors we see across Kentucky. Uh, if you look at your top left, you kind of see some browning of the trees on the edge of this field. This is what we call edge feathering. Uh, by edge feathering, you actually create the most productive habitat type there is. Uh, a transition zone between open field and mature woods. The, uh, the more type of transition zones you get, the more use wildlife will have uh, for, the more, for more time throughout the year. Uh, the middle picture here is an example of uh, dogwood, soft mast, another thing that's important uh, for many species that we try to uh, keep in our woodland systems uh, and keep available. Uh, also, you don't have to necessarily kill out your edge. You can plant your edge out uh, from the hard edge into your field and use species like dogwood, hawthorn, uh, wild plum, and those kinds of species, elderberry. You can plant those out into your field and create a softer edge and transition zone. Uh, to the right top, that there is an example of a uh, timber management or a timber harvest. Um, that right there was an ash harvest we did um, to capitalize on ash when the emerald ash borer came through. Uh, but these little pockets of diverse habitat that you go from closed camping forest to early successional habitat those transitions are really important. Uh, like this cut right here is really important for the idea of deer browse. Uh, deer browse on uh, woody, woody plants uh, the majority of the year. Uh, this is good turkey uh, nesting habitat, uh, quail habitat, and eventually, depending on where you're at in the state, eventually this will become grouse habitat. Bottom left corner, you got uh, prescribed fire. Uh, prescribed fire is a wonderful tool to help maintain your forest. And sometimes it's a driving force on what species you have there and are coming back and maintaining your forest. Uh, so it's a wonderful tool. Uh, the last picture in the bottom left, uh, if you look at the sun right in the middle of that, uh, if you look to the left of the sun, you'll see that there's a whole lot of green in the ground and there's some browning trees. This is a good example of a forest stand improvement. We took out the uh, unwanted mid-story um, and let light you can actually see the light on the left, on the right versus the left. That right there was the line of our uh, project area. On the left hand side, you'll see how it's closed off, dark, and there's no uh, there's no browse or anything coming up in the understory. So it is an important uh, is an important aspect to make sure that you provide this type of habitat not only for cover but for food and again diversity and the longevity of your forest stand. Uh, to make sure we keep species like oak uh, as a main component in our forest stands. Next uh, uh, land use or land cover type that uh, covers up Kentucky is pasture slash hayland. This also includes uh, you no know, fallow fields, old grass fields that you may have on your property. It's not just the grazing opportunity. Um, so for these, 
Um, if you look at the top left, that's just a nice fallow field that we took some cedars out of and let it come back. That's all uh, butterfly milkweed and black-eyed Susan, uh, and some native grasses that came in. Uh, just good fallow field management, and that has a lot of diversity in there for anywhere from butterflies and pollinators all the way up to the amount, the amount of uh, deer browse that's in there uh, is amazing. That's, that's actually a really good, you know, natural food plot. Uh, plus good cover and brooding habitat for turkeys and quail. Uh, just all around a good, uh, a good way to manage. Uh, and that site like they, there was, again, cedars removed and fire run through it. Uh, to the right, you got clover um, or an annual grain. There's clover and wheat. Uh, disturbance uh, keeps these open fields open. Uh, if you don't do something to them, they will grow in trees in the state of Kentucky. Uh, we do get, you know, 30, 40 inches of rain. Uh, every field wants to be trees. So doing some type of disturbance is necessary. Now the key is, is do that disturbance at the right time of year to, uh, to avoid what I call the nursery season. So uh, the spring, when your deer are having the fawns, your turkeys are laying their eggs with their poults, uh, your quail are hatching, uh, you know, just the spring of the year where everything's coming on new, um, try to avoid that time of year. Uh, allow them to get their nest off. Uh, the only way to increase populations is um, to, to allow the young to become adults. So to make sure we maximize that, you know, just the key to, to stay out of areas and let those nests get off. Uh, bottom left, again, fire is, a, is another tool to keep that area open. If you don't have the capability of doing some rotational food plots, uh, fire is a good way uh, to keep out trees and to keep a, a grassland open. Uh, if you look at the middle picture there, You'll see this is switchgrass in the middle of, I can't remember if this picture was July or August. Uh, I can't remember what year either, but you can tell it was kind of droughty that year. Uh, the pasture and behind the fence is a fescue patch, pasture that obviously couldn't withstand the heat that was uh, that time of year. So you actually had some uh, native warm season grass available for forage. So using uh, Native warm season grasses for forage uh, help, can help wildlife uh, as well as increase the amount of uh, usable days and, and weight gain on your cattle uh, throughout the summer months. Just another option. Um, and the bottom picture is just uh, you know, uh, showing that uh, you can use uh, bluegrass uh, for your next cash cow, uh, put some weight on your cattle. The last land use cover I'm gonna talk about is cropland. Uh, and what you can do to diversify your cropland to increase the use of wildlife. Um, and sometimes it's not just the idea of the use of wildlife, but sometimes uh, letting stuff go idle can actually make good business sense as far as just uh, uh, being in the row crop business. Well, these three pictures here, um, well, two pictures, the bottom left and the top right are both showing uh, field borders around the crop. Um, and this is where I was talking about the idea of uh, maybe making good business sense to, to set aside some areas. Um, a lot of times, if you use precision ag or if you just look at yields along these tree lines um, or areas that are wet that don't produce very much, uh, there may be uh, an opportunity to use uh, the Conservation Reserve Program or CRP to that pays a sole rental rate to set that aside for wildlife and manage it for wildlife uh, and get a payment instead of putting the effort into planting it and it's still not uh, yielding what you need to, to break even. So there are some situations where uh, it makes good business sense uh, as well as the benefit to wildlife. So uh, in this situation, you're actually, wildlife's just a byproduct of the business decision. Uh, and then the sunflowers there is just another idea that you got summer annual food plots that you can plant uh, in some of these and leave some of the stuff fallow. Uh, and uh, especially dove fields uh, in these, some of these crop situations of uh, when you cut silage and that kind of stuff is used an opportunity for uh, a dove hunt. The um, agency actually does have a program where if you're in the agriculture business and you have silage that you're cutting that we would actually rent it from you if you let hunters come use your property. So just another tool uh, that you may be able to use for yourself. So before I jump into the NRCS and FSA programs, I just want to say that 
that there's a whole lot of stuff you can do on your property. Uh, that you don't have to jump in and do it all at once. Uh, management is not easy work. If you think that you're just going to simply walk away from it, uh, uh, again, in the state of Kentucky, stuff needs to stay managed uh, in such a way that uh, you, you get it to where you want to. Even if you want to plant trees, uh, the idea that once you plant the trees, you leave them alone, but in 15 years or so, you may need to come in there and do some kind of management to get to where you want your end goal is. So that's what Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife provides is the information to help you reach your objective. Keep in mind that if you do calls and reach out to us to have your objectives in mind of what you're trying to get out of your property. Uh, and then at that point, we can help you come to this uh, NRCS, the so Natural Resource Conservation Service, uh, or the Farm Service Agency and help you figure out if there's financial uh, gains that you may be able to get to help you get to your objective as well. Um, so based on your objective, uh, so the majority of stuff I talked about, you can do through the EQIP program. The Agriculture Conservation Easement Program is uh, a wetland or a part of, underneath that is a wetland easement program uh, that if you have a, a wetland that's not productive on your property or you have an ag ground that you've been fighting that's wet or it floods all the time, uh, they actually have a, a program where we pay you the, the fair market value for your property to uh, put an easement on it and maintain it as a wetland. Uh, so that's another option. And then your conservation stewardship program is it's kind of the idea of once you have got your property where you need it, and if you've been managing it correctly, uh, the conservation stewardship program kind of rewards you for your management and your continued management of your property. Uh, I've already mentioned the conservation reserve program. There's different uh, avenues of this. There's a general program where you uh, compete nation, nas nationally. Uh, there's continuous signups um, where it's just kind of buffers along streams that you can sign up for continuously throughout the year. Uh, also falls in there is the SAFE program, which is uh, Acres for Wildlife um, in the, pretty well the western half of the state and a, a little bit to the east of 65. Uh, that, that program's available. Um, and I don't really go in depth with these programs. It's more of, I'd rather you talk to our biologist and kind of get you a game plan moving forward than to think about the financial incentives. Uh, the first step is getting a plan in place to reach your goals and then see how these programs can help you get there, not how you can plan to meet the program. So, uh, but NRCS is our partner on, on uh, my biologist, uh, where it's a 50-50 partnership. Um, and the reason that is, is because, again, this is the, the tools we can provide you as far as the financial support uh, to meet up with our technical guidance. And every year, we or the past few years, there's somewhere between $1.5 and $2 million set aside just for wildlife. So there's a lot of money to be had. And uh, again, we're here to help you see you through the process in that. I'm going to use this opportunity to switch hats here for just a minute uh, and talk about uh, uh, the prescribed fire council is putting on two trainings. Uh, this is a control burn workshop, one in Mercer County at the UK Extension Office and one in Greene County at the UK Extension Office. Uh, the Greene County is on February 11th and the Mercer County is on February 18th. Um, you'll see a link on the bottom of these flyers to register. Um, I do believe uh, they're going to put these flyers on resources after we have the webinar here uh, for you all. Um, and if there's any uh, extension agents out there that think that uh, they would like to host or, or have the prescribed fire council come in and uh, put on a train in your county, uh, we, we try to get at least 15 people. Uh, we like to have at least 15 people sign up before we put on a course, but we welcome, we welcome the space and the opportunity to put these courses out there if we have interested landowners. Um, along with these courses, uh, starting this year, uh, we've been able to get permission for Kentucky Fish and Wildlife to put on learning burns where you come out with uh, a crew of Kentucky Fish and Wildlife or partners uh, of uh, fire crews and see what fire is, see how, the, how it's actually a controlled fire and how we do that and talk you through the process. So once you go through this class, it gives us that ability to do that. All right. So uh, I think I've covered a whole lot of information here. Um, 
pretty quickly, but um, I'm gonna just show this last screen. Uh, the map shows what biologist covers your county. Um, to the left, there's a link to click on for assistance. And we just actually started a Facebook page uh, the, in the new year. So please click on it on that Facebook page. Uh, we try to daily show management activities that you can do right now uh, and information to help you make management decisions. So with that, I think that's about all I've got. I'll turn it back over to, to Billy and Renee there. Jacob, that was some awesome stuff, man. You really, it really covered a lot of ground in a really short period of time, but I am so appreciative of it. I know so many landowners out there that really want to do right by their land. They just don't really know how to get started or who can help them. And certainly, you know, I know we deal with forestry a lot here, but many of the landowners, they're owning it because of the wildlife for the wildlife potential, right? Yeah. Um, so it's so important to them. Um, so, you know, you covered on uh, numerous things. A couple of them I wanted to really just kind of drive home the point again, and maybe we can expand a little bit on, you know, that that objective driven, you know, that's so important. We talked to woodland owners, you know, I mean, the, the professionals are there to support you, but it's going to be based on your objectives. And I, and I guess, you know, one, one question I have for you, some people may not even know what their options are a little bit. So how do you kind of, you know, if you got a landowner that, you know, I've got this property, I don't really know what I can do with it. How do you kind of engage with them a little bit? Or well, and uh, the, the engagement is is okay. What are your interests? Uh, what are your interests? And then kind of look at the map uh, and the property with them, and kind of let them understand what their interest means versus their property. Uh, if you own a hundred acres of pure forest in Pike County and say my my interest is quail. Um, I might have to you know explain to you what that means a little bit. So not every piece of property is the exact same uh, and your objectives may not line out exactly with what the opportunities you have. Um, it's uh, so our, our goal is not to set you up for failure is to talk you through what your objectives you know what should be realistically and if we can meet those objectives um, so it's really, it is a hard thing. And I know for landowners to say, well, I don't even know what I have. Right. And that's really why I say, call us up. That's why we're here. I mean, it's the sole purpose of my, uh, of, I, I really say my biologists are the ones that do the, the heavy lifting. I'm right. just the one that gets to, that gets to talk to you all and bore you on. on the, <laughs> so get them out to your farm and let them have a nice in-depth conversation with you and support you along the way. The purpose of this is not to leave you high and dry, it's to give you the information and support you as you go through the process. Oh, Jacob, I love it, man. That's all great stuff because it is so true. You know, I know I deal with landowners a lot and they may, you know, they may hear about something on TV or something like that, or they heard that you could, you know, walnuts worth a lot of money and they want to plant a big walnut plantation, but maybe they have a ridge top farm and it's not good walnut habitat. So I love the fact that you all can give some of that education and let people know what their land is kind of would be good at, right? You know, what this property would be good at and how it fits in with the landscape. So that that's a great point, um, really, to um, kind of get some education along the way from you guys as well. So that's really cool. Um, another thing I wanted to speak to you real quick about, you know, we also partner very closely with Kentucky Division of Forestry, and they primarily work on kind of timber and other kind of you know, woodland management. But there's an opportunity for both a wildlife biologist as well as a forester to work with landowners, right? Could you talk a little bit about that? Oh yeah, the, the the idea, and this is just the best example I'll give you on how forestry and wildlife go hand in hand is uh, wildlife love oak, forest uh, foresters love oak. Uh, so the two things, trying to make sure we maintain oak in a stand, uh, depending on if it's a forester or a wildlife person, our goal is going to be the same. Uh, and and the the idea of how you get there, you know, uh, you know what you need, you know, if you have a forester to write you a plan or fish and wildlife come and talk to you about it, they're going to be on the same page of maintaining that oak in your stand uh, uh, for future generations. Uh, so that's that's kind of see now, you know, and there are some other things that you know, foresters and wildlife, uh, you know, I may love grapevines, a forester may not like grapevines. You know, there's 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 different things, but there's sure. room though. I mean, if you have a piece of property. There's room for us to have a conversation of, of where you do it on your property to meet your wildlife needs and to meet your timber needs. Yeah. There's there's those things go hand in hand the majority of the time. Very seldom, very seldom is it like we're at, at odds on what's happening. Most oh. of the time it's it goes hand in hand. 
Jacob, that's really great. And it's good to hear you kind of iterate that for everybody because I've seen it in action, right? When we have a private lands biologist and we have a forester working very closely with that landowner, with their local NRCS office, man, we can get a lot of good conservation work done on the ground, right? In a very kind of meaningful, impactful way. So um, th that's great that, you know, that we want them to work together when it makes sense, right? And it just okay. makes it and you bring up a good point about NRCS. You talked about the forest side of things. And again, the reason why my people are in NRCS offices is there's an ag side of this. Yep. Um, the ultimate goal for me is to let forestry and NRCS uh, write plans that in, that make wildlife a byproduct of them. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that they, you know, I, I want to work myself out of a job. Uh, and, and, and really, that's that's the goal of this is not to is to truly make your property and manage in such a way that you have financial benefits and wildlife benefits doing the same exact practices. That's that's the ultimate goal. All right. Oh, man, that's good stuff. That's such good stuff. So um, let me ask a little bit, or, or um, as far as availability, is it is, I know sometimes with our Division of Forestry, we have some longer wait times for landowners to get service. Are, are you all pretty caught up or um, as far as like wait time or lead time, if people want to work with you, you know, and then I'm sure it varies by biologists. Oh, it, it, it really varies, uh, really varies as well, biologists and the time of year you talk to us. I was talking about those where we're in the NRCS office, there is some obligations we have to have for certain times of year for programming and right. when you sign up for stuff. So through times of year, uh, through certain times of year, and maybe a, you know, a week or two before we can get to you. Uh, right. But uh, I, you know, please reach out to us, and, and someone will be in touch with you pretty quick and and get with you on 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 scheduling something though. No. Oh, that's that's great to hear. I, uh, I really hope you don't have more than uh, three or four weeks before we can right. get to you. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. Yeah. And, you know, and we do have a lot of county agents that um, participate in this show. So um, hopefully they'll, they'll take your um, your message to heart if they have any interest in, you know, hosting one of those workshops. And um, we'll try to plug that a little bit better for you because we do get a lot of calls from landowners and agents about burning and, you know, how to navigate that. So it's yeah. good to see that you are working so closely with Scribe Fire Council to get that yeah. stuff done. So. And that's good stuff. All right. I'm not seeing any questions, but folks, if you all have any questions for Jacob, feel free to drop them in the chat pod. I think he's going to stick around for us a little bit. Um, we've got another segment coming up here in a minute, but um, Jacob can't really thank you enough. You did a great job there. So Renee, we learned a lot about, you know, yeah. what private lands biologists do and how they can help our landowners here in Kentucky. So that's just awesome stuff. It is awesome stuff, you know, and now we're uh, moving on to our next uh, tree of the week. Um, you know, so I don't think Lori's not able to join us today. She, not, she couldn't be with us, but she did get us a fresh tree of the week. And this week it is the pin oak. Yeah. So um, you're going to be learning about the pin oak. And if you're okay, I'll go ahead and get that rolling. Go ahead. I'm Laurie Thomas with the University of Kentucky Forestry and Natural Resources Extension. And I'm here with the tree of the week, the pin oak. Pin oak, Quercus palustris, is a member of the red oak group, and it's one of the 13 red oaks native to Kentucky. Other common names are swamp oak, water oak, and swamp Spanish oak. It's a fast-growing, moderately large tree, and on good sites, trees can grow up to 24 inches in diameter and up to 120, 120 feet in 75 years. It's a short-lived species that reaches physiological maturity around 80 years of age. As with most oaks, it's an important wildlife tree, especially for bottomland water birds. Pin oak transplants well and is tolerant of many urban stresses, so it's been a favored tree for streets and landscapes. Pin oak's native range is from Massachusetts west to Wisconsin and south to Arkansas and Tennessee. It's found in the central and western parts of Kentucky. Pin oak grows on alluvial floodplains with poorly drained clay soils as well as poorly drained upland soils composed of glacial till. It tolerates intermittent flooding during the dormant season and its best development is in the Ohio Valley. Trees grown in forest stands tend to have narrow crowns, but open grown trees develop wide symmetrical crowns. Its characteristic branching habit gives the tree a distinctive pyramidal shape. Pin oak is not self pruning many of the lower bowl branches remain alive on open grown trees and although most of these branches die in closed forested stands, the dead branches are retained for many years. This characteristic causes many small pin knots in the lumber. 
It is classified as intolerant of shade and is generally less tolerant than elm, box elder, sweet gum, and hackberry, but more tolerant than eastern cottonwood and black willow. Pin oak is deciduous with alternately arranged simple leaves, as you can see in the photo. The leaves are three to six inches long and they're oblong or oval in shape with five to nine bristle tipped lobes. The sinuses between the lobes are irregularly deep and usually U-shaped and they may extend all the way to the midrib. The leaves are bright green above and pale below with small tufts in the leaf vein axle. Autumn color may be a somewhat showy scarlet to a russet brown. Pin oak is monoecious, meaning a tree has both male and female flowers. The male flowers are born in slender yellow-green catkins, and the female flowers are sh on short reddish spikes that are born in the new leaf axle. The flowers appear as the leaves develop in the spring, and the flowers are wind-pollinated. The fruit is an acorn. It's round. It's about a half inch long and has a flattened saucer-like cap. The acorns typically have striations. Pin oak begins seed production around 20 years of age, and the acorns mature after two years. Seeds are dispersed from fall to early winter and will germinate the following spring. Squirrels, mice, blue jays, and woodpeckers aid in seed dispersal. Pin oak also reproduces by root and stump sprouts, especially on young trees. The bark is gray-brown and relatively thin, and it remains pretty smooth for many years, but does eventually develop thin ridges and furrows as the tree ages. Pin oak wood falls into the red oak group and has many of the same traits as northern red oak, Quercus rubra. It's hard and it's strong. It's typically light to medium reddish brown in color, but there can be a fair amount of color variation. It is ring porous with two to four rows of large early wood pores. The pores are vessels that are formed in the spring and numerous small late wood pores. The pores are vessels that are formed in the summer. The pores do not contain tyloses as with other red oaks and the growth rings are distinct. It has minimal durability to decay and the wood is lumped with other red oaks and used for construction, cabinetry, furniture, flooring, and veneer. The occurrence of numerous small knots in the wood of many pin oak trees limit its use for high quality wood products. Like other oaks, pin oak is an important tree for wildlife. In fact, the National Wildlife Federation lists oaks as one of the top 10 best trees for wildlife. Mammals, including white-tailed deer and squirrels, eat the acorns, as well as many bird species, including wild turkey, woodpeckers, blue jays, and numerous waterfowl. Wood duck and mallards rely on the acorns during fall migration. And oaks are also a larval host for several lepidopterans, including the imperial moth, and several species of hair streaks and dusky wings. The national champion pin oak as of 2021 is in Lake Ohio. It's 245 inches in circumference, 104 feet tall with a crown spread of 117 feet. The Kentucky champion pin oak is in Davis County and it's 210 inches in circumference, 95 feet tall with a crown spread of 99 feet. If you'd like to know more about champion trees, check out American Forest Foundation Champion Trees or check out the Kentucky Division of Forestry Champion Trees. Now for a few fun facts about pin oak. The common name is believed to be derived from the prevalence of the short pin-like branches on the trunk. A black ink can be made from twig galls that are found on the pin oak. And Native Americans use the wood to, to make fasteners and they also use other parts of the tree for a variety of medicines. Pin oak, along with a few other oak species and American beech, commonly retain their leaves through winter, especially on juvenile trees. This is called marcescence. The leaves die but remain attached until new leaves appear the following spring. The scientific name Quercus is Latin for oak, and the specific epithet palustris means of marshland or of swamps, referring to its natural habitat. I hope you get the opportunity to get out into your woodlands, local park, or neighborhood and see this interesting red oak. You know, Billy, when I was sitting there watching this, I was like, how does pin oak vary from other oaks? And it's just, it, it just makes me kind of wonder, you know, as far as the oak species, because there's a lot of different ones. 
There really are. You know, I think um, we were 20 plus species here in Kentucky of oaks. So well, that's quite a bit, you know, and we largely break our oaks into two large groups, either white oaks or red oaks. And the pin oak falls in that red oak group. I think one of the things that makes the pin oak kind of unique for many of our other oaks, not all of them, but many, is that it is a really more of a bottomland species. And many of our oaks are kind of more upland. So, you know, it, it all trees want really deep soils with unlimited sunlight and unlimited moisture moisture, right? That's a perfect world, but it's about where trees can be successful and where they can be competitive, right? And pin oaks have shown an ability to be competitive in those kind of marshy, wet areas. Um, so that's where they can kind of thrive and do their best. Um, where, rivers and creeks, that kind yeah, of Yeah, along those borders around those bottom lands near the water, they can do a lot better naturally for sure there. All right, so they like to drink a lot. <laughs> <laughs> they, they, they can handle some water, yes. And, uh, uh, no, no, appreciate Laurie putting that together. You know, it's fascinating. I, I love these segments because I always pick up something new each time. So big thanks to Laurie for that. Definitely, definitely. You know what? Well, we've had a great show today. We a lot did. of interesting information. Yeah, I, and um, Jacob, I don't know if you're around, but there was one question that popped up, um, and, and I don't know if you can see it, but it's, can you work with a broad goal such as improving overall biodiversity? Um, so maybe if landowner just wants more diverse, you know, property, um, can you speak to that for a little? Yes, I think that's actually the best goal to have in general. Uh, I don't think uh, I think biodiversity is. Uh, is what we should be shooting for on every property, no matter if you're talking about deer, whatever, quail, turkey. Uh, if you look at their needs through 365 days a year, they need a diverse landscape. They have diverse needs. Uh, and very seldom is one person interested in just one species. Uh, so biodiversity is a, is a wonderful goal. Uh, now, you know, that's kind of a, a a nice easy way for us too is to just come come do as many different types of management and habitat on a piece of property as possible uh so um now yeah so yeah broad goals are fine uh it's just the key is is to make sure you have something in mind of the end the end result of what you're looking for uh and and to make sure that those two things again like uh if you tell me that you want quail and grouse on the same wooded landscape or it's like, uh, no, I can't, that's, uh, I can't necessarily. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, so, but, but yeah, biodiversity is a wonderful goal to have. And I, I like to work towards that one myself. Well, right. that's great. That's good to hear, you know, and, and again, I think folks, please remember that, you know, you don't have to have all the answers when you first meet with these um, professionals and part of their job is to kind of help educate you about, you know, what your property might be good at or, or best capable of doing. So, um, yeah. Jacob, really, thank you. Great segment earlier and um, yeah, good stuff. We'll have to have you and the team back more often. Yeah, yeah. just uh, just reach out to me, whatever I can do. I yeah. appreciate your time. And let me get the word out. No, it's good stuff, man. Really. Right. Take care. Thank you. Well, you know, um, so if anybody wants to come back and watch any of our shows, they can go to fromthewoodstoday.com to uh, see anything we've ever done. Yeah, no doubt. You can check those out and we'll have this one up here loaded pretty soon. But you can also let us know. We have a survey up there if there's something you'd like to see. So um, complete that survey. Let us know if there's um, something you want to learn about, about our woods and wildlife here in Kentucky. Or uh, maybe you've seen something interesting out there and you're not sure what it is. Um, let us know that. And we might check it out as well. You know, it's funny you mentioned that. Speaking of it, interesting, we were at a Woodland on a Short course and I had someone that came up to me and said, hey, I have a bunch of pile of rocks on my property. There's several different piles and I don't know what that is. I think it'd be a really neat, interesting segment. Well, guess what? Next week we have is that just a pile of rocks? Gwen Henderson is going to be here to talk about that. And um, so, yes, there are several different scenarios. Well, yes, it may just be a pile of rocks, but it may be other things. So yeah. be sure to check in with us. And Dr. Matt Springer will also be on to talk about uh, Serp National Serpent Day. So um, yeah. we'll be talking about snakes. It'd be great. So don't miss next week. Don't miss next week. No, thank you all for being with us. We do appreciate it. Please let others know. We know there's a lot of people that love and really care about Kentucky's woodlands and wildlife. And this show is meant to try to help support them. So please help us connect with them. Definitely. Until then, take care and we'll see you next week. Bye. Bye everyone. From the woods today.